Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Let me here on Facebook. Hello. I hope you all are having a wonderful day. Um, tonight's live session is dedicated to Yana. Um, so hello, Yana. If you guys don't know about the whole Yana thing and everything, then be sure to join Amelia's Dressage Club. Amelia's Dressage Club is a group that we have on Facebook, which is like such an amazing group. And we have, I think, about like 13,000 members right now, which is just truly incredible. And in Amelia's Dressage Club, it's really important to me and to Joellen and my whole team that it's really about community. It's about education and it's about supporting one another as riders. So Yana is one of our riders who is in Ukraine right now. And we're just dedicating everything to her this week and really wishing her the best. Um, Facebook took down some of the posts because there was so much engagement about the Ukraine stuff. It got a little weird. So we decided that instead of letting things get political, we were going to just support Yana by dedicating all of our rides to her. So tonight's Q&A is dedicated to her. And I also really just want to say that all of our thoughts are with everyone in Ukraine. And um, I can't even imagine how difficult it must be when you don't know if your horse is getting taken care of, if your horse is getting fed, if your barn is burning down. Um, that's just really, really hard. And I think it's so important to just remember to be grateful and to be grateful for every day and for all the good things that you have in your life because it could always be worse. It could always get worse. And sometimes we get so like involved in, you know, the day to day and it's really easy to get frustrated or to be negative about small things that happen, you know, like you had a bad ride, your horse didn't behave, your trainer yelled at you, there's drama at the barn. And in the scheme of things, all of that is really minor. And so I think that especially this week is just thinking of everyone and sending love and thoughts and also to all the horses in the world, but really just remembering that we are blessed and anyone that has a horse in their life or is able to ride, that really is a blessing. And so Yes, our thoughts are with you, Yana, and everyone in Ukraine and all the horses, and we hope it gets better. So what else? Um, I hope you guys are all coming to my webinar on the 13th. So March 13th, Sunday, March 13th at 12 noon Pacific time. To sign up for that, you go to www.ameliasdressageacademy.com forward slash training scale webinar. That's going to be on Sunday, March 13th. And I really love the training scale because the training scale is a proven system and method that has been used for hundreds and hundreds of years to train horses. So it started like way back when we were training horses for war. Um, but the dressage training scale, really, it's not just about training Grand Prix horses. Like, it definitely is what I use to train my Grand Prix horse, yes. But the dressage training scale goes so much beyond that because the training scale really is about having a good relationship with your horse. It's about staying safe. It's about being able to communicate better with your horse. It's about having framework and structure and clarity to your training. So I was talking to uh, Joelle and my mom earlier this week, and we were discussing that, you know, some people I know in our audience, a lot of you guys, you do dressage, but you also, your goal isn't to go to the Olympics. Like you just want to have a good relationship with your horse. Um, you just want to enjoy your horse and stay safe and go on the trail and play with a little dressage. And the training scale absolutely is about that as well. It's just about enjoying your horse and figuring out how to communicate with your horse in a system and a framework that works. So 
I'm not going to give all my spiel away, but I've been working a lot on that presentation and I really love making the presentation and the slides. So that will be fun. Hopefully, um, we are moving. So my life right now is like so insane. So in addition to everything, we are in the process of moving closer to the barn, which is awesome. But hopefully for by next Thursday and by the webinar, we'll be in the new house. I am also going to do a clinic this weekend in Texas, in Weatherford, Texas. So I fly out tomorrow and that should be super fun. It looks like we're going to have really nice weather. It's supposed to be like 70, which I'm super excited about. I get really cold sometimes when I'm teaching. Like when you're riding, it's not such a big deal because you're moving around and you're working hard and sweating. But when you're just standing there all day in the cold teaching, it gets freezing. A lot of times I'll wear like full body long underwear under my britches, but I might not have to do that this time. So that's this weekend. And what else? Oh, I wanted to have a little discussion about your feet because in the monthly workshops that I do, I do like a new topic every month and we have a Zoom call. And in this one, we were talking about rider position and we were talking about really feeling your feet in the stirrups and grounding yourself in those stirrups and, you know, just playing around with wiggling your toes when you're riding or really feeling the ball of your foot on the stirrup. Um, so there's actually, it's called the bubbling spring. This is from Sally Swift. I highly recommend Sally Swift's books, but basically the bubbling spring is the balance point of your foot. So like if you draw a line, um, through the middle of your foot. And then if you draw another line right at the, like at the ball of your foot, um, that's your bubbling spring. So we were discussing like trying to really feel your feet in the stirrups and feel that bubbling spring when you're riding. And it's been really interesting. We have a private WhatsApp group for um, members of that workshop. And we've been all like back and forth about what we're discovering as we're really feeling our feet in the stirrups. So that's been super interesting. All right, let's see here tonight. We have Edie's here, Emma, Edward, Christy, Lola. How are you guys doing? Is it is it feeling like spring yet, wherever you're living? Let me know in the comments if it's warming up or if it's still really cold. Um, we're expected to get a little rain tonight, which I hope we do. All right. Christy has a good question here on YouTube. So Christy says, how do you know if the feel in the outside rain is correct? This is a really good question. I was actually um, talking to one of my students about this today because here's the thing. We always hear this like inside leg to outside rain and you want to connect your horse from inside leg to outside rain. So you do want to have a steady feel in your outside rain, but you don't want it to be like braced in the outside rain. So in this particular instance, the horse, I've been working with my student on getting her horse to bend a little better to the right and to move off her right leg. And she's been doing a really good job with that. She mostly rides this horse, but she's out of town for work. So I've been riding him, which is really interesting to like teach a lot of horse and then to get on the horse and feel what's happening. I think that that is like really, really useful if you have a trainer that can get on your horse and actually feel what's happening, because sometimes what it looks like is happening and what you actually feel when you get on the horse are a little different. So this particular horse, he was bending better to the right, but in that bend, he was getting kind of braced and locked up on the left rein. So when I was moving him off the right leg, yes, I want contact in the outside rein, but I don't want it to feel like he's kind of like pushing through the outside shoulder and going down in his shoulders because of that. So in order to fix that, I kind of made him a little straighter in his neck and almost like a hair of Ron Bear feeling or counterflexion just to get him a little more off his outside shoulder so that when I put my right leg on, I didn't want him to collapse through the outside rein. So I think that's really 
the hard part of dressage is that a lot of it is about feel and adjusting to fit the situation and then knowing um, where to go from there. And that's what's really hard about dressage is once you've trained a Grand Prix horse, it's kind of easier to train the next one because you know what you're aiming for and kind of the pieces to get there. Every horse is really different, so they require a different system. But that's what's hard when you haven't really um, trained a horse up the levels is to like know all those pieces. All right, let's see. Um, Heather is from Kenya here. Heather says it's warm and pleasant here in Kenya. Emma, can you watch the webinar after it's live? Um, yes, so I will record the webinar on the training scale and we will send out the recording, but definitely like if you see an ad pop up on Facebook, sign up so that you're on the list to get the recording. Um, Katie says it's a cool sunset in Northern California. Yes, the days are getting longer, which is so nice. I'm very excited. Okay, I had some questions from you guys um, earlier on on Facebook on Amelia's Dressage Club. So Carrie, how do you help a horse to go back into a working gait after working on collection. My guy seems to get stuck in collecting gear. Okay, this is such a good question because it's really important that you, when you start working on the collection that your horse doesn't get behind the leg and doesn't get stuck and tight in collection. So you always want to be sure to ride your horse forward and be able to get your horse going forward after you work on the collection. Another thing that's really important is to really have clear in your mind about what is collection, because collection is not about slowing down or taking the energy away from your horse. Collection is about rebalancing your horse, getting the hind end to lower, getting the withers to lift. Collection is about actually adding activity and adding energy. So Carrie, part of your problem could be that your concept of collection or when you think you're collecting your horse, your horse is actually getting a little behind your leg or slowing down. So some really good exercises to help with this is like doing some collection and then going back to medium gait, doing a little collection and then going forward again and just really gymnasticizing it that you're not staying too long in the collection, but they're always riding forward after it. It's also important to always warm up in your working gates. So even on my Grand Prix horses, you never start out in collected gates because that would cause the horse to just get tighter and stiffer and smaller and smaller. So you always want to warm up in forward working gates. Then you do some collected work and then forward again. If you also think about when you start out with a horse, they walk, trot, canter, right? And there's not a lot of variation there. Like when you start out with a young horse, you're just happy if you can canter around and stay safe and not die. But as you move up the levels, you want to get more gears. And as much as you collect, like towards a pirouette canter, you also have to be able to extend towards an extended canter. So your pendulum has to swing in both directions. As much as you collect, you also have to extend Otherwise, you end up with a horse that's just stiff and tight. And a lot of times that causes training issues like rearing or bucking or bolting or bad things. So, okay, um, let's see. Linda, after recently changing a bit from a loose ring single joint snaffle to a loose ring double jointed snaffle, I'm struggling to have a nice gentle connection it is taking much more rain than I would like. Not sure if I should stick with it or switch back to his old bit. What would you say? So yeah, Linda, if you feel like, like if you try a new bit for, you know, a few days and it's just not working out, then just go back to the bit. Like if you felt like the old bit was better then just go back to the old bit for sure. Don't torture yourself with, um, with trying out a new bit. Okay, Nicole, how can I keep my hands quiet in sitting trot, both when I'm on and off the lunge line? My hands go all over the place. I have absolutely no control over how much they go 
up and move as soon as Aster picks up the trot. So it's horrible. What should I do? Please help. Okay, so <laughs> sitting trot is hard. I feel your pain, Nicole. I remember when I was first learning how to ride and it's hard. It's still hard. So a couple of things. One is that if your hands are bouncing a lot, the problem most likely originates in your seat. So you need to really think about your seat, your butt staying connected into the saddle. In sitting trot, you actually have to move a lot because you have to absorb the motion of the horse's back. So while it looks like you're sitting still, you're not, you're actually moving a lot like in your waist. Like if you had a, a belt on, it's kind of like your belt buckle is doing a little moving back and forth in the sitting trot. So that's the first thing is to focus on really getting your seat connected to the horse. I also recommend with the sitting trot that it's about quality over quantity. So really make sure that your horse is round and their back is up so that you have a nice place to sit. And then maybe just go from like walk to small trot and just sit, you know, four or five or 10 steps really well. And then go back to the walk or posting trot. Um, the other thing that you can do, like I've had a few students that it just seemed like they had no concept of what their hands were doing and where their hands were going. So you can either like put a grab strap on the front of your saddle. Um, one thing that I had one student do was put some thick rubber bands around the either the grab strap or like on the front of the saddle, there's those little metal rings. So put some thick rubber bands through those metal rings and then hold on to the rubber bands and your reins. And the rubber bands will break if things go like south, <laughs> but you'll also feel if your hands start bouncing around, you'll feel those rubber bands tighten. So that's another way that um, that might help you, Nicole. Oh yeah, look here, Rachel says, Nicole, have you tried using a neck, a neck rope or a grab staff? Yeah, exactly. The oh shit strap. <laughs> okay, Megan says, how can you afford horses in this difficult economy? <laughs> That's funny. So um, it is true. And then Megan says, it's easy. Stop buying yourself groceries. So yeah, I horses are expensive. That is, there's no question about that. And um, it's hard sometimes. It's really, really hard. I remember when I first moved to California and I like didn't really have a job. I was just starting my business over and um, I had my horse Trump and I was paying like $900 a month just for his board. And I would literally like I was living in a tack room and I didn't have enough money to buy myself a mattress. I was like sleeping on one of those camping mattresses. <laughs> And um, when I would go to the grocery store, I'd go to like food for less and try to like, I don't know, all I ate, I think was oatmeal and popcorn because I needed to afford my horse. So yeah, the things that we do to afford our horses. But I think that, you know, there's so much that you like, if you're poor and you really want to ride, you can still do it. Like you can. I mean, I had a lot of support from my family, but I also worked insanely hard and I would work for work off my lessons. I would go to the show and just watch the other riders. I worked like so much and anything that I could do to make money to afford my horses, I would do it. And if you want it bad enough, you will find a way like you will. I, and I really believe that you might have to work harder than you ever imagined, but you will find a way. So that's my pep talk. Okay, Rachel, my guy has a very hard time picking up his left lead. Any recommendations to get him to pick up the proper lead? He dodges much better with a right, but can struggle sometimes with that too. Um, so as far as the canner lead with a green horse, um, horses actually trot either on a left lead or a right lead. What I mean by that is if you're tracking to the left and you want to pick up the left lead canner, what you need in the trot in order to get the left lead canners, you need your horse to start flicking their left front foot out more. 
So usually with a green horse, when you're having trouble getting the correct lead, you're not really setting up for the canter like you would with an older horse. So like with a trained horse, if I'm going to ask for the canter, I have my horse round, I sit the trot first few steps, I half halt, I ask for the canter, the horse picks up the canter. When I'm riding a green horse or a young horse that's just new to dressage, a lot of times you'll just kind of trot faster and faster until the horse canters because they're not really that sophisticated and they're not really that balanced yet. But as you're trotting your horse more and more forward, it's really important that you keep thinking about getting that inside front leg to flick forward. So it's got to be like left front, left front, left front, left front. And then you have to feel the moment where your horse is ready for the correct lead and ask for the canter in that moment. So for example, if your horse, say you're riding in an arena and your horse is drawn towards the gate or the opening in the arena, you want to ask for the canter right when they're coming towards, like when they want to fall in, when they want to turn in that direction, that's when you ask for the canter. And that's how you help them to find the correct lead. So it's really about feeling that moment and being able to sense what lead your horse is prepared to take before you ask for it. And I know that's hard. That takes a lot of time and practice when you can sense What's going to happen before it actually happens? That is like, you're getting there. <laughs> you're getting there, you guys. Okay, let's see. We have, hi, MK's here from South Korea. How cool. It's so cool that we have such an international audience on YouTube and also on Facebook. It's, it's amazing that all around the world, we share this passion for horses and for riding. Okay, Megan, how can I get my horse more relaxed and round when under saddle? He is very tense and spooky all the time. And as a result, he is very hollow. Would love to get his mind more engaged and get him using his body correctly. Okay, Megan, groundwork. <laughs> if you're struggling that much with your horse and they're really tense and they're really spooky, you have to do groundwork. And I have some videos on YouTube about groundwork, so you can Google my name and groundwork. But just little simple things like getting them to put their head down, getting them to bend. It's so important. We are just um, finishing up with the Groundwork Masterclass. And that has been such a fun program. It has been amazing to hear from the students about when they get control of their horse on the ground, when they get their horse supple and relaxed on the ground, it makes such a difference when you get on your horse. And I used to do only young horses, only problem horses, and what has kept me alive and safe has been groundwork. So groundwork all the way, Megan. Okay, Cheryl. Cheryl, it sounds like she's having some issues. <laughs> Keeping my shoulders down. Okay, what can we do to help keep your shoulders down? Um, one thing that I've been working on a lot, I've been taking Pilates lately. And she always tells me, widen your collarbones, lengthen your neck. So maybe that will help you to keep your shoulders down. Overriding. Yes, overriding. I think we all do that sometimes. And why do we override? Because we want to do well and we want to do the right thing and we want our horse to do the right thing. And so we're trying to help our horse with, you know, all this leg and clucking and rain and this and that. So. I think, you know, the solution to overriding is to just be willing to let it fall apart, you know, like have something good going and then test, like if you relax, if you give, if you push your heels down, does it fall apart? And if it falls apart, well, then you were overriding and you fix it again and then you relax. It's a process though, when your horse is used to you nagging and supporting and doing all the work for them, kind of weaning them off of that and getting your horse to be more responsible and um, sharper to your aids and where your horse is pulling their own weight. That is a process and it takes time, but it can be done. So anyways, um, I think that's it for tonight. I have so much packing to do to get ready for moving, for going to Texas to do a clinic this weekend. 
I love teaching clinics. It's always a challenge when you have new horses and new riders that you haven't seen before to figure out what works for them, what type of horse it is, what type of rider it is. Um, but it's really fun. And so hopefully I'll see some of you guys this weekend in Texas. If you haven't yet, be sure to sign up for the free training scale webinar on Sunday, March 13th. And yeah, again, tonight's live session is dedicated to Yana in Ukraine and to all of her horses. We are wishing you the best and thinking of you. So you're definitely in our thoughts and I'll be here next week for you guys next Thursday. Good night, everyone.